Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Going coast to coast here over the last couple weeks as the summer tour winds down. Got a chance today to spend some time with a, an iconic international singer and percussionist. Uh, yeah. You know, all sorts of different stuff, but he's been doing it for decades in France, all over the world. Just got back from Mexico. Alex Litcherwood, an honor to welcome you to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. Good to be here. More cowbell, man. More cowbell. More cowbell. Um, you know, I, I want this to get on the record. Um, when you were in the Senate, yeah. Okay. Um, can you explain this like cyclical thing that happened when you went to Italy uh, and you were so, basically Ferroni? There was a band called the Piranhas or La Piranha. Well, it, it just explain the, the how it went from that to Ferroni to Ceccarelli, Auger, the whole thing. It's a very great. It's a great story. Well, uh, uh, we had just finished doing uh, a show up at a club in London called the Scots of St James, and we were loading up the gear, and we were actually back in Benny King at the time, and um, hmm. which you know Benny, my mentor, he uh, we were loading up the gear, and it was this extremely well dressed gentleman came out to the back of the van and he says, you know, Italian, he says, I've got this club in Rome called the Piper Club. He says, we'd like to have you come down. So we went, okay, you know. So by the time we got there, which was you know, a few months later, um, the Piranhas were there, which is a French band, big horn band, quite similar to what we were doing, you know, American R&B, soul music. And Steve was with another band, I forget the name of the band. He but, knows what it is. Hopefully, yeah, he'll chime yeah, in if he, yeah. if he if he sees this. But he was in another mm -hmm. band playing there at the same, or was he based in Italy at that time? Oh uh, no, no, no. He was just there, like like we all were. Well, you know, you, you did a month stint kind of thing, you know, and, and uh, unheard of today, but yeah. Oh yeah, it was unheard of. Yeah, but um, so we we all sort of got to know each other and become friends and stuff, and and then when uh, the Senate broke up. And I formed another group in Italy. At the time, it was called the Saltworth Camel, with uh, some other Englishmen who you, were living you, there. You were responsible for forming that band. Uh, well, it's not it's not the Saltworth Camel that you know of, which really? was an English band. It was another band called Saltworth Camel. Wow. Well, we didn't realize at the time there was another band called that, so we ended up just calling it Camel. Then we found out Peter Frampton had a band called Camel. So, but anyway, um. So I left the Senate, and the Senate kind of broke up. And some of the guys went back to, to, to the UK. I stayed in Italy. And and then the camel broke up, and the piranhas with Andre Ciccarelli contacted me because they had a singer, a guy called American ex-serviceman called Rocky Roberts. He'd left the band, and they asked me if I wanted to join. So I did, you know, and uh, no, what a great band, you know, and I was quite happy to be back in a big horn band again, you know, and um, so then Chickarelli left, and Robbie McIntosh joined. That's what Robbie. Thank you. Yeah, Robbie McIntosh. He joined the the Piranhas, and we went to southern France, and and then we went back to Italy, and Robbie and I were playing with. Uh, Four American service ex servicemen called the Four Kents, kind of like the Four Tops. I love this. You know, I love it. Yeah, I love and, it. Uh, and then Robbie got he get a call from from London, from Brian Auger. So he eventually went back to to Great Britain. I stayed in Italy for a little while longer, and uh, then I went back to England. And Steve Ferroni joined the Piranhas. You know, so uh, I get back to Italy, and I mean, I get back to England, and uh, that's when I did the, that little stint with Jeff Beck. You know, Robbie's playing with Brian Auger, and my whole thing with Jeff Beck didn't quite pan out. I mean, I'm grateful that I got the opportunity, of course, you know. So I went back to France, and then the next thing I know, I get a call to come back to the UK to join Brian Auger with Steve Ferroni. And then Robbie dies. 
You know, it was he 74 or somewhere in Well, there. he went off to form the AWB. Exactly, yeah. yeah. He left Brian Auger to go form the AWB with some other Scottish friends of mine, old friends. And um, let me see where am I now. <laughs> it's a little confusing. No, the, the, so, then, then uh, so, so Robbie Ro- dies. Ferroni uh, uh, goes to, to take the he AWB. He Brian Auger, goes to the AWB. Ciccarelli comes to and Auger. And I bring Ciccarelli into the Brian Auger band, and we come here to the States. And the fu- we rehearsed in the ballroom in Detroit, I think it was. And uh, the first couple of gigs, we were opening up for Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters. Return to Forever and Earth, Wind and Fire. And I'm like, wow, you know. Uh, I have a great memory of one of those shows. It was middle of winter, and uh, I think it was the Michigan Palace in Detroit, and we got there late, it would snow up to your behind, and I get in there, and I'm going up to the dressing room, and I hear this voice, and I'm like, what the hell is that? So I go back down, I walk up to the side of the stage, and there's this huge black man standing on the side of the stage. He goes, what do you want? I says, well, I, you know, I hear this voice. <laughs> he goes, well, who are you? I says, well, I guess I'm on on next after the whoever's singing. He goes, oh, okay. So I look out on the wings, and it's Minnie Ruperton in a spotlight, just her, in a spotlight on a stage, and she's got this amazing voice, you know. I mean, like, uh, I mean, the, I mean, I get goosebumps right now just thinking about it, you know. You know, I mean, it's it, it, she come to my garden. That what a transcendent singer oh she was. I mean, did you grew up in in Scotland? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, can you just talk to the audience about? I mean, let alone you, if you were going out to get a bite to eat or play a gig. Like how dangerous did you have to really fight your way into to respect? And you know, I'm just trying to because we this and this is we're in suburb, not just here, but I mean it's we're living in kind of a, a a police state kind of time. If you go around, a lot of heavy security, but back then it was more people enforcement. Oh, I just yeah, want you I to mean, paint the picture I mean, of that upbringing. Law enforcement in in Scotland, especially in Glasgow, I mean, we had a lot of respect for them. I mean, they didn't carry guns. You know, they didn't most care. of them came out of the military, just like most policemen in, in most countries. Um, but we grew up respecting them, and you know, we would just run, you know, <laughs> run away from them. <laughs> you know, there was no, the riffraff. Yeah. There was no fear of getting shot in the right. back, you right. know. Um, but um, Glasgow, like Liverpool and Belfast, and certain towns like that, were very. Very blue collar, you know, very industrial. So there was a lot of gangs, you know. And but fortunately, because most of me and my friends who were involved in music, we kind of skirted that whole thing, you know. You know, there was always a lot of violence at shows, and sometimes, you know, the band they wouldn't deliberately get involved, but get in the way, so to speak. Right. You know. And, uh, I mean, it was dangerous. I mean, if you missed your bus home at night, you know, you had to walk. And that's when it got dangerous. You had to know when to cross the street if you had something coming up towards you. Just cross the street and, and avoid it at, the, at your peril, you know. You you are a fearless warrior on the bandstand, but is there was there a moment in, in time when you had to protect your life at that you know any because i mean even the, even in the in the the live shows the rolling stones the crowds would would charge the stage and you talk about the danger there sometimes with carlos you if someone got up on the stage is going back this is obviously in the 70s you'd step in mm. but did you have a, a seminal i mean i've never met anybody as fearless just on the band just singing his ass off as you i'm like this guy came out of the, one of some of the toughest neighborhoods around. Yeah, I mean, I've never actually been injured. No, you know, and uh, I can only really remember one instance, and I, I don't remember, what, but it was with the Santana band, and somebody got up on stage, but they weren't heading for me; they were heading for Carlos, and probably just because they were enthralled by it. Right. But I stood in the way. Only because it's just a natural thing to do, you know, you protect your friends. You know? With a mic stand. 
Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I probably wouldn't have used it, realizing that the guy was not going to hurt anybody. <laughs> but, you know, um, no, I've been very fortunate in, in that kind of circumstance. It's, it's never actually, you know, gotten to me where I've been injured or I've had to injure somebody else. And thank God, you know, I mean, that's just not where, what I'm about, you know. Talking to Alex Lidgerwood here on the Jake Feinberg Show. People are loving you and they miss your voice a lot. I'm not going to have you sing right now, but um, when you... Not unless you pay me. Uh, yeah, but I got a couple. I'm living high on nickels and dimes right now. So, uh, but <laughs> let me let me ask you, uh, with your song creation, um, whether it was with Auger or with Santana, right. did the rhythms come first or the vocals come? Uh, can you talk about a specific tune that? that um, I mean, how do, how do, how does it work with you? You know, I mean, it, how, where's the germ of the song come from? Wow. Where does any song come from? It comes from, you know, just out of the ether somewhere, you know. Um, most of the times, I mean, I, I really enjoy collaborating with, with people, you know. Um, I think my forte is if somebody gives me a melody, then I can use that melody. If I can use that melody, I will, and I can change it to my style or whatever. Um, I, I, I'm more of a, a lyricist than actually, although I do write melodies, yeah. Yeah, no, can you give an example? Like, um, well, listen to the new Troc album. <laughs> Troc, uh, the, the legendary yeah. France jazz jazz Razor's yeah. Edge band, yeah. Whereas with, with Brian and Carlos, I mean, that was a total collaboration with those two and, and others in the bands, you know, so, and, and that's, that's that's a fun thing to do because you can get the bounce off people and you might think your idea is great until you hear somebody else's idea and you go, oh, wow, that's great. You know, I love that kind of thing. I get surprised, you know. When when I Tommy Coster was gleeful about working on the road with Ndugu, they came up with... Uh, Tom or Tommy? Tom Tom Cobb, the, the elder Tom. Yeah. And so, like, in 75, this is a little, I think probably before you joined the band, but they were in their yeah. hotel room shedding, and they, you know, tell me, are you tired? They came up with all these tunes. Who was, was it like that? Did you get, like, on tour with whoever it was on the Santana band? Like, she's oh, not yeah, there? Or, sure, like, yeah. I mean, like... Yeah, predominantly, could, Carlos would come in with an idea, and some of us would sit down with them, Chester and myself... And uh, we just hash out. Chester Thompson. Chester Thompson, yeah, from T.O.P. Um, so it was, you know, it was always kind of like that, you know. Um, Benny King. Yeah. Aside, we, took, we we vetted him pretty hard, his persona. Um, is there, can you just talk about how he, his spirit oh, wow. superseded even who he what even who he was as a person i mean i to me it was like you said that he touched hearts just by being in the room and i noticed today in music today well it depends on where you're going but that visceral reaction uh is harder now because of you know the the um distractions that exist in our society now and i just wanted you to talk about maybe the first memory you have of playing with benny well, and you know and, i think the difference nowadays is is it's I mean, I, and, and don't get me wrong here, I mean... No. The dancing, the the spectacular, the, the light shows, the... Um, back in the day when it was just Benny and the band, you know, he always had a musical director, guitar player, a guy called Jim Bowie. Oh, of all names, yeah. And, uh, what was his responsibility, basically? His responsibility was making sure we knew what we were playing. The dick. You know, dick. because at the time, they couldn't bring a whole band over. It was either too expensive or something to do with the unions. And and Benny would walk on stage after we'd be done rehearsing and stuff, and then we'd start touring England, and then we'd start touring all the American bases in Germany, you know. And that, that was just a blast. Um, wow. So... I have one one particular story that always sticks in my mind. Mm. And I'm in the bathroom. I'm at a urinal. We all men Natural use men use it. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. And Benny walks in, 
and he used to couple of urinals down and so I would just yeah, yeah. I said I said, how do you do that? I said, how do you walk on a stage and have the people in the palm of your hand? He goes, Oh, that's easy. I went, Oh really? <laughs> he goes, Yeah, that's easy, man. I said, Well, how do you do that? He goes, I'm walking into my living room and I'm inviting those folks to join me in my living room. And it was that simple. And I went, wow. So that stuck with me, you know. When I walk on a stage, any stage, anywhere in the world, my whole idea is, that's my living room. You know, I'm comfortable there. If you want to come and join me in my living room, please come on in. Is there a way to articulate where you were at uh, psychologically before he made the living room comment, I mean, were you? I, I was mean, trying to be a rock star. Was, what is that? Okay, so you, you were know, just trying, dan- flying around. Yeah, and, you know, tr- trying to look at me, look at me, look yeah, at me, as know, opposed like, to just like, like all being, of us, you know. Yeah, right. At the time, you know, it was like, <laughs> aren't I good? You yeah, know? right, right, right. You know, right, 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 right. Uh, don't you like me? <laughs> so uh, that was a revelation, you know, and that's when you know I, I, I kind of fell in love with just playing music. You know, did you could you talk to the audience? I, I do this with cats, and uh, and you sing. You know, you burn so hard when you sing. I mean, could you talk about a time when you left your physical body on the bandstand? Never have. Never to, like Billy Cobham, Mount Vishnu Orchestra was on the side of the stage. This was potentially one of those shows that you might open for him. It was the end of a tour. He was exhausted. Right. It was fatigue. Mm-hmm. And he saw himself playing on the side of the stage. Yeah, it's never really happened to me. Never had. So, uh, what is? Uh, what? I mean, I can understand it. How, okay. You know, I can understand it where you know you're just at a point where you know your your physical being needs some help from your ethereal being. You know, <laughs> you know, because I mean, it's people think it's all a glamorous life. And it is to a certain degree, but everything that goes into actually d- getting things done before you actually perform is the hard part. You know, the traveling, the, the, the lack of sleep, the, the, the food, you know, it's... I mean, you put up with it because, you know, the end result is going to be hopefully a great performance and a great time, you know? Wow. Yeah. It's, I mean, didn't Benny kind of? I mean, he he was he was modulating between those two, the multi dimension. I guess it's more the multi dimensional self. You know. I mean, it seems. Did you work under other blues cats before you came to the states? That oh yeah, They're, that 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 really had that effect. With the same with the same band, the Senate. We had this kind of shyster agent in London who was bringing over all these black American acts, like, you know, Edwin Starr, Solomon Burke. Edwin Starr? Solomon Burke, uh, Garnet Mims, Big Maybell, Benny, uh, the Persuasions, the Drifters. So we did a lot of that stuff. There was a couple of bands in London at the time. It was uh, the Ram Jam Band. Um, there was a few other bands. And we, we did a lot of that stuff, man, you know. We were cheap. We just wanted to work. <laughs> Your friends from 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 Troc, uh, yeah. th- this incredible fusion band. I hate that word, but uh, I know. I keep yeah. using it. Yeah. Uh, this this melodic, burning band. Um, do do you ever? I mean, your kids live in France, and I, yeah. I, did you? What was your incentive to come? Maybe it's evident, but explain why you decided to come to the states. Music wholeheartedly music and let's uh, be clear though that's, the whole, the because whole, there was because at the time there was a touring circuit and there was ability to make records it's different to, I mean today you may not make that it's a whole different thing today right but at the but, time but go the ahead. goal I mean the ultimate goal was to come to the United States and hopefully get the opportunity to to play or to get to meet some of my musical heroes from Tom Motown or you know Stax or you know all of those artists you know and, um, I mean, I got very fortunate and I'm very grateful I got to do a lot of that, you know. But that was always the goal. I mean, the music that, that, that we loved, 
from, you know, not only from me, but Eric Clapton and everybody else. It's all American music, you know? It wasn't created in Europe. It was created over here, you know? So that was always the goal, was to come over here and, and hopefully be a part of that, you know? When you came, uh, did you have a gig lined up already, or were you... Because, well, like, Graham Nash climbed a palm tree when he got here. He said the same thing you did. Right. Because the, it was This was truly the land of opportunity as it related to art. Right. Art was considered a profession. Right. It was a profession. At least you were respected that Not way. anymore. No. So did you... I mean, did... Again, that we had that six degrees of separation with the piranhas and, right. and auger, but did you actually have a gig, or you just came flying well, blind? What happened is... Uh, uh, at the end of the Jeff Beck thing, we were supposed to come and uh, do a tour for, for CBS, but that kind of fell apart. So uh, I went on back to France, and then I came back again to join Brian. Brian goes, goes I'm going to America, you want to go? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, beat me with a stick, you know. <laughs> of course I said yes, you know. Um, what was the most surprising I remember Auger, we did a bunch of interviews, and he, he walked in one night in New York. Probably you guys were together, I mean, uh, in the band. You guys were playing in New York, and he walked in to see McCoy Tyner. Right. You know, and um, there were about nine people there. I think I read that. Yeah, you no, know, and he said interview. to Herbie, yeah. he said, he, he, later he said, why? This is absolutely perplexing to me. These guys are heroes of mine. Right. Not only that, they're, you know... They're they're recognizing my music as well. On top, they're very and, and yet the people here don't don't get it. And Herbie said, "There's some kind of filter." He said, "There's some kind of filter that that." But and that might be a sort of an esoteric way. But what was the most surprising thing? Not necessarily a positive thing. That that you know the perception that you had coming here, as opposed to when you finally hit hit the turf. Well, Brian's album, I think it was called "Closer to It," had broke in Cleveland, Ohio. Local regional radio in Cleveland. Yes. Wow. And uh, they had these huge posters up. So when we finally got there, the audience was 75% black. They thought he was black? Not necessarily. It was the music. They dubbed the music. The music was more... How could you not? It was so dance. Know, it was so soulful and danceable. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, it's like with the AWB, everybody thought the AWB were black until they saw them on stage and they went, oh, because the audience just loved that music, thought it was a black band because it came from black American music. And, you know, Brian's stuff and the stuff that we did together, you know, um, came out of Herbie Hancock, Jimmy, Jimmy Smith, and, and we had vocals to it, you know. So, I mean, I think that was the most surprising thing to me, you know? I, I mean, I was, like, pretty happy about it. And we made a lot of friends in Cleveland, you know, tall, black American basketball players who would take us to their part of town, you know? Can we, can we get a name or a couple names of the Cavali uh, couple, couple Cavaliers no, players? Larry Nance or something no, like that? No, I mean, nobody famous, really. You know, but um, basketball players, Doug, J Doug Melodic, and probably they loved. Wilt Chamberlain was hanging out. These yeah. before you got here, but I, I love that interweaving of multi entertainment. So we we went, which is now called the Hood, up in uh, in Cleveland, and we walk into this party. You know, these guys invited us to their party, and who's sitting at the table in there but Greg Allman? And I went, oh, okay. You know, he was the only white guy there, you know, except for us. Wow. wow. He know? was there to check you guys, check He's out all. soulful cat, you know. So it just showed me just racism was very, very, and still to this day, it's still, it's still a problem, a serious problem. But it wasn't coming from the black neighborhoods, that's for sure. Because we were welcomed. Didn't regalo, didn't matter what color we were, you know. Plus, we were musicians, so I guess it makes a difference, you know. And then there's an educational component to it as well. A Jam Jamerson was was bro so many geniuses uh, that happen to have black skin. I mean, we're all one human race. I mean, the, mu the music, yeah. that's what I've learned, whether it was Dizzy or any, it, it, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. Uh, and But yet, they didn't, Jamerson, for instance, didn't advocate, didn't know how to advocate, didn't wasn't educated enough to ad advocate for his, so he died broke. Right. When did you get hipped? Did you get 
I mean, again, we know the tell the truth story with, with Beck, but right. that, did you learn to advocate for yourself right away? Because, I mean, were you getting royal, when you were making all those insane albums on RCA, you get all those writer's credits, or did you get burned, and then did you learn, you didn't want to be... No, I got my writer's credits, you know. Was that, like, something that, like, like, Lowell George, for instance, Paul Barrera would say that, like, everybody in Little Feet, was responsible. Everybody gets a piece of the pie. So every, I mean, it was very... Oh, yeah. there's no question. That was definitely happening, yeah. Uh, no, I want to talk to you about, like, with Augur's philosophy or any of bands, I mean, was that the the idea of saying, it's not, you know, it's not, I'm not going to take all the credit for the, everybody's going to get a, a share in this right. with Augur. Did, was that how you mean, it went? You mean in the writing process? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, I mean, yeah. can you talk about how that helped yeah. the, um, uh, yeah, the just the whole idea of further creation because right. everybody was getting acknowledged. That's correct. That that it's human. Is it moral? Is it correct? What is the it's, right? It's, it's correct. correct. It's, you know, it's, it's what you're supposed to do. You know. I mean, anybody that that, that has the idea where they created everything by themselves, and you know, and whoever was involved in in helping them didn't get any credit. Well, there's only one more than that's assholes. You know, and that's you know. That's part of the business That's too. Just the the ego thinking. You're, I don't know the word to use. I don't want to do any more sweating. <laughs> it's all right. It's, we're not being rated. The FCC is not looking over us right yeah, now. But right. you know, I mean, you. But I've been fortunate, in, in most of the people that I've worked with are very, very honest. You know, there's been a couple who. Not naming any names, but there's been a couple who think they're God's gift to the earth. But uh, most of the people I work with, I would say 98% of them are very straight, you know, very, very honest. I would say that those, the, the couple people you mentioned are probably, they probably are pretty miserable as well. No, they didn't know. They're oblivious, and then just they think they're God's gift. Yeah. I, I just there's a, there. I wanted to ask you. This is again sort of uh, a multi-dimensional thing, but uh, it, the idea of sometimes, as I've talked to all, so many cats, they they talk about <clears throat> the gray beards. As you guys get older, uh, you you know someone's got plenty of gold records, tons of money, plenty of cars, and they're miserable. And the phone's not ringing as much. Mm -hmm. And what the overarching point is that what what a lot of the cats say is they they that that person uh, didn't get, didn't realize that they really had nothing to do with the music that they are merely a conduit for the music coming through them, mm -hmm. coming through oh, them. Yeah. Do you feel like how have you over time learned to manage your ego? Um. It, it's, it takes a long time, you know, it, it's hard, it's hard work, you know, because if you believe everybody, everything that everybody says about you, oh, you know, you can fall into that trap, you know, and I'm sure I've fallen into that trap numerous times in my career, in my life, uh, at this point in my life, um, that has changed. Uh, the most important thing to me is playing with my friends, playing the best music I can be a part of, my family, and not necessarily in that order, you know? So, you know, the, the ego is still there. You have to have a certain, but there has to be balance. There's got to be some kind of balance. And I think it, where I'm at right now, the, at my age, that balance is getting pretty good. Was it when you would you get humbled like uh, when your ego was when you were beginning to get your head was too? Oh full? yeah. And then would it be more like? Um, I was when we were all doing drugs back in the seventies and the eighties. Drug. I mean, the, 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 people are still doing drugs. I mean, it was just it was it was just like. Uh, um, can you talk about a a, a a a time when you were pretty high on yourself and then you were brought back to 
to at least this bring planet. Back to reality. Yeah, bring you know, <laughs> it, it just because you know there are peeps that are that are watching this and 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 for people that in twenty or thirty years, you know, when they see this, uh, it, it's important for the tangible quality to know that cats like yourself got humbled. Well, there, there's an old commercial, TV commercial, where a guy's holding an egg. He says, this is your brain. And then he cracks the egg in it a skillet, and it sizzles. I know that one. She says, this is, this is your brain on drugs. Well, trust me, it will happen. It doesn't matter what kind of drugs you're doing, you know? You get that yolk, and it's just, it's, yeah. it's messy. You're going to fry your brain, and, you know... Hopefully you you hold on to the egg a little longer, <laughs> but uh, but you attribute it to a substance abuse, really? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You know, nowadays I don't know if it's, they say heroin's back in vogue, and you know, I think that one of the biggest problems in today's society is legalized opioids pushed on by pharmaceutical companies Huge. onto the doctors who then in turn on at the patients, you know, and I think that's a major problem. Well, especially you go to smaller towns, flyover towns in this country with not a lot of culture. It's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of money here in LA, but you go and that's all they got. So the farm, big pharma is just driving all this stuff in oh, there yeah. and you have these, you know, the, you yeah. hear people talking about these chronic opioid things. The entire town is on them. Yeah. And it's all for profit. Uh, but do you, there, to me, Merle Haggard, I had a chance to catch a hang with him, but rest in peace. Um, he was in the hole in San Quentin. He Who? was arrested, Merle Haggard. Oh, yeah. Okay, 12 times. Yeah. And he was still making hit records. To me, have we become a more punitive society? He was making hit records. He was in the, the hole. Right. Reagan expunged his record. Right. But I understand what you're saying about hard drugs the yoke, this is your brain on drugs. But have are we becoming more punitive, more callous? Do you feel that or do you still feel that love and heart and fire will win out? Well, that's the sincere hope, yeah. You know. What um, gives you hope? Good people being around good people. Who are, you know, they're just living their life to the best of their ability without any substance abuse. You know? I mean, the whole the whole system of, as you say, punitive. I mean, a lot of these prisons now are run for profit. Well, I should you make know, it clear: like, if 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 Merle, ha if you got busted with, we if you get busted for two for for a bag of weed, you're gone for 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 15 years. Merle was getting out every. I mean, he would have had no career. Yeah. So, that's the that's the part that that bothers me. It hurts. It hurts. Man. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, you know. You're, you're. How much do you? How, which one of your grandkids is 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 carrying the Litcherwood torch as far as the singing is concerned? I mean, are they belting it out? I mean, it's they're uh, not on the they're not on the. Uh, no, not yet. My my granddaughter just turned. She just turned thirteen a couple of days ago. Teenagers like. Oh. Yeah, my daughter's thirteen. My, my God, my that's... grandson. I haven't seen my grandson for some time. So, no, but he's too young anyway. Um. But my kids, they're, they're not in the music business, but they are very artistic in their own way. Well, I have to believe. Yeah, and my uh, my eldest daughter is uh, a director of uh, an independent film company, a uh, documentary company in Paris, who are responsible for the movie The March of the Penguins. So she was a production manager, and she's now become a director in that company. And uh, she's doing very well. She works her tail off, very creative. Uh, my youngest daughter graduated from um, special effects makeup school here in Los Angeles. She got, and that's a really difficult system to get into. She's now she she has a license to do ladies' nails, and she's very creative at that. And my son, you know, he he went through uh, a period where. He, you wanted to be a musician, and it didn't quite pan out, but, you know, it's okay. Everybody's healthy. So you have three daughters and a son? Two daughters and a son, And yeah. a son, three. And they all live in 
France or they all? No, no, no. Uh, my eldest daughter and my granddaughter are in Paris. My middle daughter and my son live here in Northern California. We talked about this earlier. You, I couldn't ask anyone better. Dexter Gordon, Johnny Griffin, all the the, the heavy around cats. midnight. All Eddie Lockjaw, you know, uh, uh, Dolphy. They all moved to to Europe yeah. for very mainly because their 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 their, their art was respected. Right. Yeah. Thank but God. there is racism in France. Oh, there's racism everywhere. I, I, that's, I just wanted I to dispel that theory. You I know, I don't care what country you come from or what what languages. There's racism all over the world. I mean, we had racism in Glasgow when I was growing up, and predominantly against Catholics. Protestants. Really? Oh, but I mean, how did? It, but it, it wasn't like separate bathrooms. What was the? What did that racism look like? You just didn't like them. Okay. They weren't like you. That's what racism is. Sub, so you're, you're less than. You, you know. know yeah. But Great Britain was. They colonized so many other countries, and you know they're paying for it now. You know because there's so many immigrants want to move because they have British passports and. And when the Pakistanis and the Indians started moving in, and and we already ha- had Italians and Poles. It's, this is Scotland. Scotland's a little different. Um, yeah, it is. You know, they're, they're welcoming refugees in because they're now, those folks are now second and third generation Scots, you know. But but there's always been racism. It doesn't matter, what, you know. It's like, you know, the guy done the Sikh gets beat up on the street because everybody thinks he's a Muslim. They don't know the difference. You know? Mayall, when I, John Mayall, when I interviewed him, said yeah. there was no color bar in Europe. But I don't... And That's then, not true. And then David I, Clayton I Thomas said that. the same thing. I mean, I'm not... I'm not th- these guys idolized black, you know, great musicians. But I, I, I was under this impression that, you know, at my own country bumpkin, 40-year-old, never having been to, to Europe, that there was no color bar, but that is not, it, it still oh, yeah, prevails. It and it's more today now because they really yeah. have uh, let the... Uh, I think there's always been a color bar, man. I mean, especially folks from Africa, you know, India. Who, who are the colored folks? You know, well, the Germans are not colored, although there are quite a few... Um, Germans who had American servicemen as fathers, and now they have their own children, so the, the melange is still going on, you know. Cat, who's going to be turning into this is, uh, just he just friended me on Facebook, but uh, Gerald Car- Car- uh, Car- Gerald Carboy. <laughs> now, did you, you, when you, when you got hooked up with Offord yeah. to go to see David Sanchez, to, right. go, to go do your thing with Sanchez, you didn't know any of those cats going in. Right, uh, Eddie was the only one I knew. Yeah. I can you just talk about how electric that that group and and then ultimately how much different that that, that album still has ne- nothing's ever been close to that album vocally, yeah. nothing. Well, that's David Sanchez, man. I mean, I really had nothing to do with the. Well, writing. You, you were brought in for a reason. I was brought in for one reason and one reason only, and that was because Eddie thought that that I could cover the the breadth of what David was trying to do, you know. And, and that's one thing, you know, as a vocalist, for me, I've never been stuck in one idiom, you know, because I've, I've, always, I've always had the, the fortunate experience to be able to sing different stuff and be a part of different genres of music, you know. So I think that that really helps me, you know. Or genre list. I don't even know what you would call that music. Uh, well, R and B, a soul. I don't. It's, yeah, I mean, it's very progressive. You know, for the time, it was very progressive. You know, and uh, yeah, I just saw a, a photograph of David and Gerald Cowboy and Boom Ernest Boom Carter, Gail Boggs. You're always correcting me on ba- the, Gail Boggs these singers singing their ass, singing their butt off. I mean, I'm just saying that this is like. If anybody doesn't have that album, right? Tone, right. it's called Tone, right? Yes. Monster. Actually, it's called David Sanchez and Tone. The album is called True Stories. True. Uh, still one of my favorite yeah. albums. Oh, me too. And you can't even—I still can't get my ear completely around it. Um. You know, 
I, I had a chance to hang with Jeff Tamalier, and he told me about a band with Garibaldi, you, Morgan, and him called the Hungry Farmers. Yeah. Okay. Lonely, Where, lonely, the lonely, the lonely farmers. farmers. That, it wore, I was, I was like, <laughs> the, I, explain, please. I don't. I think it came out of. I don't Ruffles know. has an appointment soon, but yeah. yeah. Oh, hang on a second. Where is Ruffles, dude? Yeah. Oh, he's around yeah. somewhere. Talking to Alex Litcherwood here, an incredible vocalist, and kind enough to let me into his beachside house here, um, here on a just another Wednesday afternoon. But I think it probably came from Jeff. And the David. Lonely Farmers. Yeah, I think it probably came from Jeff and David, Jeff Tamalier and David Morgan. And I don't know why Garibaldi was not playing with T.O.P. at the time. I'll tell you why, because of, yeah. because of because the drugs were out of control. He's like, he was out. Was, he, like, yeah. he, you know, I'm not. But how? I mean, what was <laughs> that? I don't is, think we ever did a live gig. You just kind of just shed it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, we kind of wrote some music and stuff, you know. And I don't remember doing it a live gig. I just saw Jeff Tamalier last week. I did a session for um, Doc Krupa. Oh, for his new album, the man. The man. So, so I walk into the studio. A Barry monster Barry Sax player. I walk I walk into the studio in the valley, and it's uh, Johnny Lee studio. Johnny Lee Shell. Yeah. Oh. And I walk in, and who's in there but J. R. Robinson, Mike Finnegan, Tamalier, Doc, and uh, uh, Bobby Vega, and I'm like, oh, I couldn't get anybody good. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> So that was a blast, man. You know, Finney, I love those cats. You know, see, these are the these are the people that you walk in and they go, "Hey, how you doing, man? What's going on?" Even if you haven't seen them in a long time, you know, it doesn't change. You know, they're still that affectionate. You know, and that's man, that's wonderful, man. Yeah, I think that's maybe one reason why I connect so much with you guys is because even with my oldest friends too, I may not see them for 15 years right. but then when we connect again it's like I, n nothing ever left off right. and I've, I you know all the cats you mentioned fans I mean they're just so accessible and and accessibility is at a premium now in our society there's so many handlers out there now um, and it's so hard for regular people to be able to connect with people that they might idolize and, and look up to and, and it's so important because you guys are just regular peeps yeah. you know you're not uh, and sometimes you get put on a pedestal um, the, uh, the, the city section though, that, that was originally with Ginsburg and Maybe, Mark yeah. and David and Jerry Cortez. and, Je and my man and the, and the most beautiful cat ever, Cortez, the most beautiful cat ever. Not and I'm still trying to, <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> the most ridiculous guitar. Monster, Who man. could, I mean, you listen to that, the, 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 the again, uh, you guys kind of formed because you were thinking that maybe you could be a studio rhythm section, or were you out playing live? Uh, we were just doing local stuff up in the, the Bay Area. Basically, uh, you know, David David and I had kind of been in and out of Santana, and we were just looking for something to do, you know? But then uh, Mr. Billy Kreutzman walked in and saw you, but he knew you. Well, David actually, you know, Morgan, he had the thing going with the Kreutzman Morgan band. That was Brent and a guy named Kevin Russell. Well, I don't know that Brent was involved in that You're at right. the beginning. You're right. Uh, You're I don't right. remember who, who was all in that, but, uh, that eventually became go ahead. Yeah. And I, I think that was the reason for that was, um, Jerry had gone in, into the hospital. So the dead had come off the road. And uh, there was all this stuff out there, that, you know. So they decided to put it together with me and Brent, you know. And Brent was, Brent was amazing, man. What a musician, you know. Which 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 vocal harmony did you? Who got higher? Oh, I, mean, I would I would all pretty much get the high stuff, yeah. Because I mean, both yeah. you could go high. Yeah, but Brent, Brent had this throat. Yeah, he had this grit, you know. The, the uh, to me, and I just want to go back to Cortez's guitar playing because I don't know anybody who could have played in a band with Billy Kreutzman and played as flaw as beautifully as Jerry did improvisationally. Yeah. Brent could improvise, yeah. Jerry could improvise, uh, and then you know you listen to this show. Justin Kreutzman, Billy's son, was at this gig, 
um, uh, at Passaic, it was, on, it was on Halloween, and Billy was had had a few drinks, and he got off and started to say, "I was born in a whorehouse," <laughs> and uh, and and I'm just thinking to myself, like I this, love Billy Grossman. you know, I mean, it just explain. Billy got caught up in what I consider dead incorporated. People call it dead and company, but right. it's kind of corporate. Um, can you just talk about uh, being a, how how if those tours because you guys strung that out for a while and Garcia actually came to a gig in eighty seven eighty eight and court and he loved that band. Mm. That band was cooking, mm. but what was the 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 what made it fun? On the, you know, just because you talk about the grind. I mean, you were, you were, the, the hotels, the food, all the this. Crowd. Sh- the deadheads. So it was all, it was all, de- the deadheads were on fire. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they were, they were unpretentious. And, you know, they were having a good time. And, you know, they, they didn't treat us like we were stars or, you know, put us on a pedestal. They were just, let's have some fun. I mean, that was the whole dead thing, you know. And we got to actually, you know, get to share some of that, which was really cool, man. What's on tap for you the rest of this year? I mean, I, I know you. I mean, you missed uh, Garfield to be tuning in later. You had a CD release party. Uh, yeah. You know, you uh, you just got back from Mexico with Champlin. I mean, you're not uh, you're not having a a downtime at all. I mean, what what are you cooking I'm on? I'm going to be done. I'm taking pretty much the month of September off. I'm not going to be doing anything. And How I, could you with this? With this yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, we're, we're, we're yeah. right on the beach here, you know? Yeah. That's beautiful. And I'll probably go back to Europe in October. And play with Troc? No, I'll play with Brian. Wow. And Brian Over. And the Bolivian excess. <laughs> I was going to say, um, you crafted the song. It, my younger daughter, when she was a baby, and still... We only let the the album the 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 song you recorded on, um, you know, uh, the first there was two issues of from the from the whiskey a go go, and it was tell the truth. But that song was written by you when Maggie Bell had you come into to Bex Jeff Beck's group. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I brought that song into the Jeff Beck group. Yeah. And then, th- did you ever actually see that album get get cut, or you just found out which album? The one well, you were had. on, yeah, you were. On, did that um, song? Because I mean, he took credit for it. Got it. cut twice. That album got cut twice. Yeah, Rough and Ready got cut twice. Um, I, I don't quite. I, I've heard a bunch of rumors, but uh, my understanding was that Jeff's managers at the time was Peter Grant and Mickey Most. Peter Grant obviously being the manager of Led Zeppelin. And uh, right. the, the story I got was we had almost finished the album. Well, this is true or not, I don't know. So I may be talking through my butt. Um, they paid somebody under the table to get the master tapes. So Jeff had to get an injunction on them from releasing the master tapes and went back in the studio to recut some of the stuff. and. Uh, and then that was when we had a parting of the ways and Bobby Tench was brought in, who was a good friend of Clive's, Clive Chairman, the bass player. Bob was a good singer, great singer. Um, and so after that, you know, uh, from what I understand, some of those tapes are in Abbey Road. Unaccessible. Whether Jeff's got them back or not, I have no idea. Yeah. But just want to be clear, they recut your tune with Tench. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you something to the world. The the they missed out. I don't care what the, the, that live tune just for my younger daughter has what are been. You talking about truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. That even though you were singing a little out of pitch, you got really. It was live. It, yeah. I mean, it was the most. It remains today a seminal, uh, and I think the album for my family and my children and. Oh, cool. As I let you go, I just want to tell you, man. Um, cool, man. You, you know, keep burning and uh, keep inspiring because the vibrations are unquantifiable, and you have no idea how oh, much we, we've gotten off on on Alex Litchwood, man. So, thanks for being part of the program, oh, my brother. Man, my pleasure. At any time, and uh, keep listening to music out there. You know, there's there's a lot of great music, 
it doesn't have to be spectacular or nothing against Beyonce and everybody else. They're doing their thing and that's wonderful. But there's some real live musicians out there who are just playing for the joy of playing music. So check them out. Go find them. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, the truth is it's not even listen to music. Be a patron of live music. There you go. Go sit, go yes. sit, go dance, go hang. Yeah. Because Litchwood's been belting it out, and he's not anywhere near stopping. Much love, Alex. Thank you. See you around. It's the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll be back later. See you later.